Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Boxer. I'm a urologist at UCLA, uh, and I am happy to be able to speak to you about cannabis and the urologic practice. Uh, my colleague, Neil Baum, helped me with, uh, with this, and I always give him as much, all the credit he richly deserves. And so in the, this particular program will cover how does cannabis work, the myths associated with cannabis, safety of cannabis, and the urologic applications. The, my journey to learn about cannabis started when I saw a patient a number of years ago who had metastatic renal carcinoma. He was in intractable pain and anything that we gave to him was of no benefit. And so therefore, uh, we, he came to me and said, I'd like to try cannabis. And what do you think? And quite frankly, at that point, I had no knowledge about it whatsoever, nor did my colleagues. I thought about it and, and after he came back and had a very particularly terrible experience because the person who was supposed to help him could not help him. And it was about seven or eight years ago in Los Angeles before that was when, when it was only medical. And so I decided I was going to learn more about this. And as I learned about it, I wrote about it and have been speaking about it. But more importantly, I wanted to share my knowledge with my colleagues because pa this is a patient-driven patient medication and people want to know about it. And it's only uh, the best thing for your medical care to know about it. I'm in no way advocating it. I'm just simply saying knowledge is important. So with that, I wanna proceed. The responsibility of, of a urologist, I believe, is to just know a little bit about, or even more about the use of, of the uh, of cannabis. Now, it, just the tip of the iceberg is some of the conditions that may be uh, help, and we'll talk about those conditions in a moment. But there's so much to learn about cannabis. And one of the problems is that because it's Schedule 1, that is, uh, it's not allowed to, really to be researched within the universities, the Schedule 1 has prevented and has become an obstacle to knowledge which I think is wrong. So all of us end up having anecdotes and stories by patients, and that is not the best way of guiding our care for the patient. We really need to have evidence-based um, medicine, and that evidence-based medicine will come, but first, the obstacle of being on Schedule One, like heroin or LSD, has to be overcome. 95% of, of us live in a state uh, in, that has uh, either medical or fully legal mar marijuana. And only if you live in Nebraska, South Dakota, or Idaho is it completely prohibited. Otherwise, your patients have the access to medical or for that matter, recreational, but we're only gonna be talking about access to obtaining marijuana for medical purposes. Interestingly enough, it's been illegal for so many years and it's been, uh, it's been con considered to be dangerous all the way back into the 30s and far before that but in the 30s when there was reefer madness or in the 40s movies that that portrayed it as as a terrible drug well if you go back you find out that the declaration of independence was written on hemp paper and so people have known about this for a long time the consumption of cannabis is based on speed rate of metabolism and choice there are various methods by which you can you can consume, you can smoke, or you can vape. You can hear this person is using a bong, which is water pipe. Um, you can consume it in, in candy or, or foods of some sort. And what happens is that if the person takes cannabis by smoking or vaping, you, they get a much ra more rapid cons um, effect by the cannabis. If it's um, eaten, it's a much slower effect because it has to be metabolized. Well, under those circumstances, some people will take one or two pieces of candy or, or a brownie or a piece of candy um, uh, in a candy bar and say, oh, nothing's happening. And then they'll take a second or third piece. And by the time the third piece or fourth piece is ever consumed, the, um, um, the um, effect will become multiplied. That's why people need to be very cautious when they take medication uh, uh, through uh, food, which is metabolized. Now, 
it's very interesting to me that the vascular system, the lymphatic system, and the nervous system have all been well described for uh, hundreds of years. And yet, it, the endocannabinoid system uh, was only discovered in 1992. And as you can see from the receptors, the receptor of CB1, which is THC, uh, which is more the, uh, the, the portion that people think about when they think about um, effect psychologically or neurologically, or CB2, which is also known as CBD. And people think, well, how can we possibly have a medication or a drug that affects all parts of the body? I mean, literally soup to nuts. And we are urologists, we know the difference. And so we have to wonder what is it about this drug, this meta the, the uh, CBD or THC that really affects everything? Well, the fact is that there are different receptors for CB1 against CB2. And the CB2 are principally the ones that, that will affect things that your uro urologists want to take care of, particularly in uh, reducing inflammation or reducing pain. And so when you understand that the receptors throughout the body um, are different, then you understand why CBD and THC and generally marijuana will affect different people in different ways. The, the facts um, about cannabis are that it's been used for thousands of years. And it's, um, I showed you the number of states, 33 states in the District of Columbia where it's medicinal, to me, um, District of Columbia is also recreational. Um, it's off limits for scientific investigation. It's classified as Schedule One, as I mentioned, be same as heroin and LSD. And in fact, there's more research been done on heroin and LSD than on marijuana because of all the laws uh, and truly became a, um, and has become a political plant. Um, and there's limited evidence for abuse. Yes, it, it can be abused, but there is limited evidence. And that's once again, because the research does not allow people to really find out what is in that plant. The plant has 144 chemicals within it, and we only know of a few. So cannabis and evidence-based medicine is critical in my mind, because that's what we've been doing working on as clinicians all of our professional lives. Patient values and preferences and best evidence and clinical expertise all center in evidence-based medicine. And since it is truly a patient-driven um, medication, people don't uh, will not go to a doctor, generally speaking, a urologist and say, uh, what do you think I should take? And the urologist starts out by saying, uh, take cannabis. That's not gonna happen. What happens is the patient comes in and says, I wanna take cannabis, how will that affect me? Because it's, um, it's been controversial and, uh, and promoted by lots of different organizations and groups and, of people, finally, the National Academy of Sciences and Medicine looked at it and put out in 1999, 21 years ago, uh, a book that showed that, the, that it is effective, conclusively effective for chronic pain, nausea and vomiting, with chemotherapy, that is chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, as well as muscle spasm and, and MS. Now, those are the three things that, that the National Academy has found that it is conclusively helpful for. But there are complications, and that's why the complications in pediatrics and pregnancy is that you, the great, there's a greater number of NICU, NICU uh, admissions in women who have smoked uh, marijuana or consumed marijuana while pregnant. There's also premature births and underweight. But if you think about it, uh, if those women were to take uh, any other drug, even alcohol, for example, uh, or, or other drugs such as cocaine, which are much, much more addictive, of course, they too would get a um, greater number of ICU admissions and pr premature deaths. That doesn't excuse it, but it just shows you that, that drugs are bad for pregnant women. There's no conclusive evidence for, that it causes heart attacks, strokes, or diabetes. It doesn't um, cause respiratory diseases such as chronic, like chronic uh, cigarette smoking. There is some thought that if you smoke um, every day multiple um, marijuana cigarettes, it would have some lung disease or issues. But no one, very, very, very few people do that. And actually, <clears throat> in excuse me, in, in uh, California, for decades people were smoking considerable amounts of marijuana and, and studies showed that they really were not affected like they would be 
had they been smoking cigarettes. It does not improve immune competence. And some people have even thought it would be good for treatment of testicular cancer. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, but for cardiovascular effects, it does elevate systolic and diastolic soon um, after consuming marijuana. It causes tachycardia, increases sympathetic stimulation, decreases the time to angina, and there is a slight increase in MI um, for one hour post marijuana use. So, you know, just like everything else in life, you gotta take consideration any comorbidities. And so therefore, if someone were to have significant cardiovascular disease, you would say that, that, that it's a bad idea to smoke marijuana for any purpose. Now, another myth is that it's a gateway drug. That has been disproven repeatedly. And yet it is repeatedly um, spoken about. And so uh, it's, all you can do is try and try again. The National Academy of Medicine and Institute of Medicine in 1999, the same book that I referenced before, has indicated that it is not a gateway drug. Uh, but what we really need is research, not anecdotes, so that people will be able to know what to, um, if it indeed is helpful. Another myth is that it causes cancer, it does not. Um, and when a person comes in to be seen and they ask about cannabis in a medical, in a, med in a state that only has medical marijuana, um, and frankly, just the knowledge of knowing what, in a state that has recreational as well, um, or adult use as well, the, you just have to say, let us look at the, what is um, each, what is allowed in each state, that is for the medical purposes. But, and also it's good reference for you to be able to determine whether or not there's medical marijuana that would be helpful uh, in any particular state. And you can say, well, I guess that's at least uh, anecdotally, if not evidence-based, that it might be helpful. So for example, in Illinois, interstitial cystitis is a qualifying condition for the use of cannabis. And so if a person were in California and they said, well, I've got uh, painful spasms because of interstitial cystitis, you could say to yourself, well, it is allowed in, in Illinois. There may be proof that it's helpful. And uh, I, I, can't, I cannot um, uh, prescribe it, but I certainly can say that it is recommended or at least possibly used in Illinois. Cachexia due to cancer is another common condition that is that people use cannabis for to stimulate their appetite. Uh, terminal illness, hospice care, uh, chemotherapy induced nausea, muscle spasms. That's why I put in interstitial cystitis here because if it helps in MS, muscle spasms may be an interstitial cystitis as well, or for that matter, um, other muscle spasms. It's, it's been um, stated to be helpful in Parkinson's, spinal stenosis, spinal cord disorders, and we of course see patients that have uh, that have those conditions which result in urologic um, illness. PTSD, rheumatoid arthritis, sickle cell anemia, at least the pain associated with it, intractable pain, and every state has the, um, the ability, or I should say, has um, stated that if doctors find a condition that is diagnosed as debilitating, then um, marijuana in a medical state can be recommended. Now, Pain is the most common reason for, uh, for using medical marijuana. 100 million Americans have chronic pain. And so this is the reason why chronic pain is the most common, by far and away, the most common reason why people use medical marijuana. Others is multiple sclerosis, chemotherapy-induced vomiting and nausea, and um, cancer, as I've listed before. So you can see that over 50% of the people will um, want to use medical marijuana for chronic pain. Uh, why, again, why 50%, greater 50% use marijuana for pain? Well, in 2016, 214 million prescriptions of opioids were used. More than 60 million Americans consumed acetaminophen on a weekly basis. Over 30 billion doses of um, NSAIDs were, were given. And um, 80 million aspirins are consumed a day. Uh, not all, of course, are for pain, but, that's 117 aspirin tablets for every man, woman, and child in the United States. The opioid crisis in the United States is, is absolutely um, um, 
at an epidemic, and unfortunately we know about epidemics now, but it is at an epidemic rate. As many as one in five who are opioid addicted received um, opioids as prescription for non-cancer pain. 11 million abuse opioids and a, mil and a thousand people are, go to the ER every day for opioid misuse. Uh, the, the most chilling thing is the 72,000 people who die every year. Um, and that is more deaths. Um, there are more deaths since the year 2000 for opioid than all the deaths that occurred on the battlefields in every war since 1775. It is a spectacular amount of people who have, have died. And as it turns out, um, marijuana is a, could be a substitute in some individuals and does not kill. And this is the reason why it doesn't kill. I think that this is the most important slide there is. Why do opioids kill and THC does not? And the reason is the receptors. The, the, the cannabis receptors are in, the, in this portion of the brain and in the cerebellum. The opioids are in the, um, this portion, but most importantly, they are in the brainstem for breathing. And so this is the reason why opioids kill and cannabis does not. There has never been a death due to overdose of cannabis, but 72,000 people a year um, die of cannabis overdose in the United States. As time has gone on, it's become more and more um, uh, legal in various states, but more importantly, and in this particular side, shows that, that Americans believe it should, that medical marijuana for sure should be legalized, 62% versus 34%. And just in 1969, when, when, uh, I, went, I, was, when I was in college in medical school, 84% thought it was, should be illegal and only 12% legal. So attitudes have changed and that's why your patients are coming in to talk to you about it. Uh, so the summary is cannabis is safe. It is not a gateway drug and it has several urological applications. You can see the annual deaths, 435,000 from tobacco, 75,000 from opioids, none, none from marijuana, 100 from peanuts. So you can see that even, even um, Peanuts are more dangerous than marijuana. The, um, finally, it's one joke um, by Bill Murray. I find it quite ironic that most dangerous, the most dangerous thing about, about weed is getting caught with it. So the dangers are few. The, um, the potential benefit is great. And in this, in this particular talk, um, I, I hope I was not trying to convince you to use it, but I'm trying to talk to you about and educate you about why some people do. So thank you very much. If you wish to contact me, there is my email address. I wish you a great day. Thank you.